This time on Poll Hub, a new project from our partners at NBC News looks at the history of African Americans as a force in the Democratic Party since the 1976 presidential primaries. Fascinating stuff. Steve Kornacki is here to discuss the results. And we'll also talk to him about how race is playing a central role in this election. Let's get to it. And hi, everybody. Welcome to Poll Hub. I'm J.D. Dapper, Director of Innovation here at the Marist Poll. And I'm Lee Merengoff, Director of the Marist Institute for Public Opinion. I should point out that Barbara Carvalho is practicing democracy today. She's on jury duty. Oh, lucky her. Yeah. We're yeah. all very, very envious of, of that. She's been there quite a while, so we're not sure what's going on. We'll find out when she, ever she emerges. Well, I was joking earlier. There aren't 12 angry men in that room. There's 11, 11 people and one angry woman right now, <laughs> I'm guessing, after all this time. Anyway, we are not here to talk about jury duty, but to talk Talk about uh, race and politics, specifically uh, black voters uh, in the Democratic primaries, in the Democratic Party. And and the reason we're here to talk about that is that uh, NBC has compiled uh, or started a really interesting project involving this. And Steve Kornacki, national political correspondent for uh, NBC News, MSNBC, the guy you've seen up at the screen, uh, wildly gesticulating. I hope I didn't throw you under the bus on that, Steve, uh, is here to talk about it. Welcome. Thanks. I'm, I'm actually wildly gesticulating in my office right now, so don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> well, hopefully there's no vases around you're going to knock over. So um, before we get to the project, because it's really interesting, we do want to get into it. Uh, race has uh, become this central issue of this campaign. You know, it had been before, but especially in the last week, we, we're speaking right now in between the first and second debates um, uh, in August, in July here on CNN, the CNN debates in Detroit. And uh, race has become a central focus in this 2020 campaign. Does that, based on what you know about this, based on your work in this project, does that surprise you? I, I guess it, it makes sense from two standpoints, right? I mean, number one is just um, it, it basically one out of four votes in, in the Democratic primaries next year are going to come from African-American voters. And uh, that number could end up being the largest ever. So just from that standpoint, you know, the cloud of black voters um, it may be more than we've ever seen in, in, in the Democratic Party. Um, and also, you just have so many um, issues, so many themes involving race have, have really kind of defined and, and served as the backdrop in some ways for the Trump era. Um, I, I think you just got those two things going on. Um, add in the fact that you have two major black candidates in this race, Kamala Harris, Cory Booker. Um, and yeah, I do. I, I think there's uh, I, I think there is more attention on it, more focus on it and, and potentially more importance to it than than we've seen before. And, and I know we're going to talk in a, in a second about the Democratic primary, but the fact that the president uh, has been talking race issues uh, over the last couple of weeks um, what is that going to do likely for turnout and the attention that the African-American community might play, I guess, to the primary, but also to the general down the road? Yeah, no, I mean, that's that, what's that's one of those questions I think 2020 you know, might end up hinging on the general election. Um, the primaries will offer us, I think, some clues there when you just start looking at turnout, because, you know, as you know, um, black turnout was down in 2016. You know, w yeah. with Obama in 2012, I think it, the, the rate was 67% in the general election. With Hillary in uh, 2016, it was about 59.5%. Um, and, and you look at the margins in some of those states, uh, that's, <laughs> that's a big part of why Donald Trump is president right now. So it's, you know, you hear the theory that, um, you know, the, the way Trump has handled race as president, um, it, 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 how this has just all exploded is going to serve as motivation to get you know more black voters participating in 2020. Um, you also hear the argument that one of the counters I hear to that is just that, um, you know, Trump in a lot of ways was like this in 2016. And the Clinton campaign thought that that would do a lot of the, the, the motivating mm -hmm. for them. And it, it didn't then. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, is that one of the risks that uh, last night in the debate, it was 10 white faces, right, for representing the Democratic Party in Detroit, where they're trying to speak to a broader electorate. I mean, is that one of the problems that Democrats face here, is that without uh, a compelling candidate on the ticket that will be attractive to African-American voters, 2016 may be repeated? Yeah, I mean, that's it's sort of an open question, isn't it? I mean, the, I mentioned 2012, and also you could you could include 2008 there, the two Obama elections. Uh, you know, black turnout was, I think, 66 and 67 percent in those two elections, um, higher than we've ever seen. And in 2004, 
the election before, you know, that before Obama, it was 60 percent. And in 2016, the election after Obama, it was basically 60 percent. So it, 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 how significant was just simply the fact of for the first time in history having a black candidate nominated for president? Did that create turnout levels that that won't be matched in the future? I mean, I think it's one possibility. Um, would having a black candidate back on the ticket in 2020, something that hasn't happened, you know, since Obama, would that, you know, make a big difference? Is, is, you know, and then, of course, the other wild card here is um, you look within the Democratic race right now. It's the 76 year old white candidate who's leading the black vote right now. So, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> yeah, no, 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 no doubt about it. All right, let's crank back to uh, to the you know what I thought was just a phenomenal uh, study that you guys did. Um, you know, relying on exit polls, but you crank it back to 1976, uh, the beginning of where we really have you know solid exit poll numbers to, to work with. Um, talk about some of the surprises you found along the way starting back with jimmy carter and uh uh and if you could throw in a little bit about uh when you win the black vote you sometimes end up with a nomination yeah more than sometimes uh, uh lately <laughs> right and it's um yeah it was a fascinating project i mean I, I the first thing i'd say folks listening to this podcast would probably appreciate this because we uh every presidential election we're used to just scouring exit polls and digging into all the you know the different subgroups um the shocking thing to us was when we when we first had the thought to go back and look at um, the, you know, the history, the rise of the black vote. We said, OK, well, let's go look at all the old exit polls. We're, we're here at NBC. Right. Let's let's go dig them out. We don't have them. <laughs> um, <laughs> it was it, it was shocking. I mean, it, it, the, the way exit polling is done has um, has changed through the years. You know, the individual networks in the early days, in the 70s and 80s, would do them themselves. You know, NBC would have its own poll. ABC would have its own poll. Um, and uh, a lot of these places just kind of discarded them um, and, and weren't really thinking, I think, of the long-term historical record. So we were able to find a, 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 a professor. His name is William Mayer up at uh, – uh, Northeastern in Boston, who's done a ton of research into this, and he was able to help us come up with the data. But yeah, I mean, it's 76 is is an interesting place to pick it up with. You mentioned Jimmy Carter. It was a gigantic Democratic field that year. You know, about 16 people ended up running mm -hmm. at some point. And, and it's relevant now because you think about racially, in terms of racial issues in 76, think about the backdrop of that campaign, busing. Everything that's been talked about with Joe Biden um, and, and how Joe Biden as a senator was handling busing in that period, you're, you're looking at uh, and we're looking at in, in this data, um, you know, how how voters were deciding in part on that question. And, and it's interesting. You, you can look you, you can see this in the project. We have a story for each individual election. We got archive video, archived uh, 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 archive pictures, and also we've got the the black vote from exit polls for every individual primary. And one that jumps out in '76 right away is the Massachusetts primary and, and busing. You know, South Boston. That was that was just after the peak of the the busing controversy in Boston. And you had Jimmy Carter went into Massachusetts and he put newspaper ads into black newspapers featuring an endorsement from Martin Luther King Sr. And then you had uh, Scoop Jackson. That was his big opponent in Massachusetts. Scoop Jackson ran against busing in that primary. And you saw that was Carter carried the black vote in Massachusetts. Um, and, and in part because he was one of the only candidates even who willing to pursue it at all. Um, and so you go from that where, where it was it was um, it was considered a very delicate thing by these. It was all white fields of candidates, and it was very delicate to even pursue the black vote. They were very afraid of stirring backlashes against, you know, they used to call them the white ethnics. Um, you go from that to 40 years later, um, you know, 2016, as we say, by 2016, basically a quarter of the Democratic electorate nationally uh, is African-American. And it's uh, it's now not just a courted, it's a coveted constituency. And, and Jesse Jackson in the 80s yeah. plays a critical role in pro propelling the black vote uh, as part of the Democratic primary field. Yeah, it's and it's one of those. I, I think Jesse Jackson is one of those sort of historical figures, I, I, modern historical figures, whatever you think of him, whatever you think of his politics. I think he's sort of due for a um, what would they say, like a reappraisal just in terms of his importance to modern politics, because the, the, the story realizes there was. There was this rising alienation that, that black leaders felt with the Democratic establishment you know, around the time of Jimmy Carter's presidency. Um, and, and Jackson stepped forward in, in the early 80s and he said the only way to fix this 
um, is to run a national campaign, uh, have a black candidate run a national campaign. And, you know, Shirley Chisholm had run in 72, but she'd only done a few primaries and she hadn't generated much support. Um, Jackson said this needs to be a, a, a national every single state effort. And black leaders, a lot of black leaders in that time, um, I, I find there's a quote, I think, in the article from the executive director of the NAACP at that time, who's, who's just basically saying, this is a terrible idea. Don't do this. We need to, you know, find the most electable white candidate, get behind that candidate. And Jackson went forward and, and ran anyway. Um, and his campaign was as much about trying to win these primaries initially as it was register voters, register black voters, because this was two decades after the Voting Rights Act. Millions of African-Americans in the South were unregistered. And Jackson, through his two campaigns in the 80s, 84 and 88, um, registered millions you know, of new voters, created a new alliance uh, between, uh, then create a new alliance, but cemented, I'd say, the alliance between these black voters, uh, especially the newly registered ones and the Democratic Party. And then also, I mean, there's 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 ripple effects to all this, right? Like Jackson becoming a prominent figure in the Democratic Party in the 1980s, he became somebody that, that Republicans started to run against. And so there was sort of a backlash to Jackson that helped reshape the Republican Party in many ways. So I think there's there's all sorts of effects and sort of ripple effects coming off of, of Jesse Jackson there in the 80s. I, yeah, it's it's funny you talk about Jesse Jackson because I, I see that as a bit of an inflection point in this in this story of of um, African Americans in the Democratic Party. I was actually that was my campaign in 1988. I was uh, assigned to cover Jesse for about a month or so. I was uh, I worked in Iowa at the time in television in Iowa, and what was so interesting to me in Jesse Jackson's campaign was how many progressive white voters there were in his crowds, mm. uh, even in in pretty traditionally black cities that he would travel to. And it kind of now that you're mentioning this, it strikes me as also a place where uh, the progressive white part of the Democratic Party and part of the, the, the black part of the Democratic Party, there was some cementing going on there, too. Was is there any are there any other inflection points um, that in looking at this data kind of in a historical way that you think are worth noting? I think, for instance, about who we call the first black president. Bill Clinton. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. I wonder, is that inflection point or, or is the next big inflection point uh, 2008? Yeah. I mean, I think I think Obama's obviously the, the bigger one for all sorts of reasons. The Clinton one is interesting. Um, it, it, Bill Clinton wins the Democratic nomination in 1992 in large part or at least in, in significant part because he won 70 percent of the black vote. Um, and, you know, he had the whole story of Bill Clinton gets hit by scandals and comes in second in New Hampshire, but was able to call himself the comeback kid. And where he really gets his legs is it, it's in the South. It's Super Tuesday, you know, Southern dominated Super Tuesday was in 92. And Clinton just, you know, cleaned up um, among black voters, built this huge lead. And, and, and that was kind of it. The what if the great what if from 92 is there was initially a black candidate, Doug Wilder who was the governor of Virginia at Virginia, that point. Yeah. yeah. He's the first popularly elected black governor in, in, you know, in the country. And initially, Wilder had this... this Wilder was a much more moderate political figure than Jackson. And Wilder had this notion of, you know, I can take the black base that Jackson has and I can expand like I did in Virginia to white voters. He didn't get off the ground. He dropped out of the race before the first primaries. But there was some indication in the polling when I went back and looked at it that Wilder would have would have won the black vote on Super Tuesday and maybe maybe complicated uh, uh, Clinton's path a little bit. But that's yeah, I think you say that you're right in terms of the real hinge points. I think Jackson cementing the bond of black voters to the Democratic Party and registering so many in the 80s and then Obama getting elected in 2008 and then all of the subsequent reshaping, I think, um, or, or, uh, or refining or whatever you want to call it of the two party coalitions that, that resulted from his presidency and that we're still sort of dealing with today, I think, is the other the other major one. Yeah, you, you bring up the uh, the South and the, and the role that it plays. And you know, I'm thinking even in this uh, particular presidential primary, and, and it's been in the previous ones as well, just the sequence of the primaries that the Democrats go through, starting in Iowa, New Hampshire, and then we sort of find our way very soon thereafter in South Carolina, mm -hmm. where about, I believe, 60 percent of the Democratic primary vote is black. Um, and that could play, I would think, in 2020, kind of like a pivotal place for people like Biden and maybe Kamala Harris, assuming that they're still very vibrant at that point. Yeah, I'm glad you raised that, too, because that's the other thing that, that 
that surprised me and I've kind of forgotten, but, but putting this together reminded me South Carolina was not always South Carolina in democratic politics. No, you know, it was no. a, it was a caucus in the eighties. It was kind of buried in the middle of the process. And in 2004, in a nod to the, the, the rising cloud of black voters and the fact that New Hampshire and Iowa are so overwhelmingly white, um, Democrats moved South Carolina up and turned it into a primary. Um, and then 2008 was the first time South Carolina as a primary became a standalone event, you know, one of those first few contests on the Democratic side. And you're right, like we all remember, um, South Carolina and its placement on the calendar in 2008 was so critical for Obama where he'd had that, you know, Iowa victory. He'd had the loss in New Hampshire. Remember, they went to Nevada. Clinton even won Nevada. And they went to South Carolina, and and the Clinton people thought, you know, we can keep this close. We got momentum now. Maybe we're not going to win, but we can keep it close. And it was that was where Bill Clinton kind of melted down on the campaign trail. Um, that caused long-term damage for him. And, and, that, and Obama wins the thing by almost 30 points. And that was just – that moment um, – I think is one, obviously, it had a significant after sort of aftershock where um, yeah. every other primary after that, Obama is then getting 80 percent plus of the black right. vote and he's the president. Just to look ahead. So you've looked at the African-American vote within the Democratic Party over this last period of time. But the African-American population as a percentage of the U.S. population hasn't increased significantly, unlike Hispanics. Is there a story to be done with this same kind of survey? Maybe not this year, but are we maybe four or eight years away where it would be a really interesting uh, thing to look at the Hispanic vote in with regards to the Democratic Party, but also the Republican Party? Think yeah. about Bush and, you know, how he was trying to to change the way the Republican Party dealt with the Latinos and Hispanics. I, I Yeah. And I, it's um, Bush, right? The, the exit poll in 2004, right, said 44 percent. I think some people say that might have been a little high, but right, Bush was able to win a significant share of the Hispanic vote as recently as as uh, 2004, and, and and then they have the plan to to roll that victory into immigration reform and to try to make Hispanic voters a part of the Republican coalition. It's crazy to think uh, only 15 years later that, that that was where the conversation was, and and and, and here's where here's where everything is now. Yeah, we, we thought about, and we're still thinking about trying to find a way to do, um, to take a look at Hispanic voters. The challenge, obviously, um, is there, there's a, a, a kind of breadth, <clears throat> pardon me, that I guess the term Hispanic or Latino is so broad in terms of, um, and you have some very distinct voting patterns within that, you know, Cubans in, in South Florida being sort of a famous example. Um, but it's, it's, a, it's a little harder to pin down. With, with black voters, you have a group of voters who, since 1964, in every election, have given at least 80 percent of their support to Democratic candidates. So there's been a real stable alliance there with the Democratic Party. So we thought that made it. Um, and also, when you look at, at these um, – these primary results, um, you mentioned this too, Lee, a minute ago, since 92, since Clinton in 92, every Democratic nominee has won the black vote. And the black vote is generally in those races gone overwhelmingly for that for that nominee. For, you yes, know, yeah. 70, really? 80 percent. So yeah, high numbers. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. We're, 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 it's it, it's a group that's tended to vote as a block and to back the winner. So that was really what drew us. But, yeah, it got me th- doing the project. Absolutely. It got me thinking about the Latino vote. Um, even I was talking to somebody here um, at, at, this, at uh, NBC the other day. said we should do it on the Jewish vote in the uh, in Democratic primaries. But it's <laughs> much, much harder to find an exit polling. But yeah. there's all sorts of stories that I think you can you can do, you know, <laughs> to, to too small, too small a sample. <laughs> right. say. Well, uh, if people doubt the value of exit polls or that journalists don't go into depth uh, on any particular topic, I think you've really answered both of those with one study. Uh, and also your book uh, last year uh, certainly contributed to the, both of those as well. So Steve Karnacki, thank you so much for, for joining us today on our podcast. Thanks for having me. I always uh, enjoy doing this one. And that'll do it for this edition of Poll Hub, which is a production of the Marist Poll at Marist College in Poughkeepsie, New York. To my right, Mary Griffith, our executive producer, these 106 uh, episodes, and Casey Schaff, <laughs> our editor, as always. Uh, we'd also like to thank the Roper Center Archives at Cornell University who provide us with the ability to look back in time at survey questions and results over the decades. And we will have Barbara Carvalho back from jury duty by next week. Jay? Well, we, we hope so. We're not entirely sure. You know, this could be... <laughs> 
one for the ages, right? Yes. Some yes. tiny little, yeah, anyway. Uh, yeah, we want to spring her quickly. Um, if you have questions for us or if there's questions that you'd like for us to ask people in polls, we do that too, as you might know. Reach out to us on social media. We're at Maris Poll on Twitter, Maris Poll on Facebook. And as we always say, don't forget to subscribe. We'll see you next time. Thank you.